Good day, everybody. Thanks for coming out for the, uh, I guess it's June program meeting for Y Cars. I'm John Jenner, I'm the uh, vice president of the club. And uh, good to see everybody tonight. We've got uh, at least one new face here. Um, so uh, I'll let him introduce himself. Matt, would you like to stand up? Hey, guys. Thanks, Matt. Welcome. What's your, what's your call sign? What's your call sign, Matt? Uh, I'm still going to change it, but Kilo and Mike for Tango Hotel Lima. Tango Hotel Lima, yeah. Okay. Well, tonight's presentation is kind of uh, <laughs> thrown together, so I apologize. I got a last minute call to, to do this. So um, we're going to talk about uh, antennas and antenna rays, parasitic and phased. And uh, we're also going to look at a piece of software which I use to help design software or help design the antennas. Um, and it's called MNANA-GAL. Okay, it's based on a uh, piece of software called EasyNEC or EasyNEC. Um, it's basically the same engine. E EasyNEC is a lot more potent piece of software than this is. But um, so we'll. We'll get started here. Uh, let's see. Bear with me just a second. Oh, that's not what I wanted. Why isn't this working? Here we go. All right. Now we're good. Okay. So basic antenna modeling using MNNA AGL. Um, it's a free download. There's the website to download it. Um, the newest version was done in 2012, so it hasn't been updated recently, but it works fine for what you're going to do. The only thing hinky about it is, is sometimes your resistance value for your SWR is a little off, but in practice, you know, you may have to make a few adjustments to it. I wouldn't cut directly to what they tell you to cut to. Um, they do have a user group out there, and there is a, a pro version of the software that's been updated and, and is a lot better, but it's some money. I don't remember what the cost is on it. And then, of course, you have any uh, easy NEC or easy NEC is uh, another option for you if you want to do this kind of thing. So I know most of you guys should know most of these terms, but just in case you don't, um, radiator, that's the radiating element in an antenna. Uh, radials um, are wires either that are, are surface or sur slightly buried to form a ground plane. And you hear the word counterpoise sometimes used um, um, as you know, a, a, an interchangeable term. A counterpoise refers to raised radials. Um, so um, if you're going to have like a ground plane antenna that you're going to raise the feed point above ground and feed your radials out down to the ground, kind of like a two meter, you know, standard two meter antenna, that's a, uh, those, that's a, uh, those wires coming off of that are counterpoise wires, OK? Um, isotropic antenna. Uh, you'll hear a lot of people say uh, DBI, you know, you're basically comparing to an isotropic antenna. An isotropic antenna is a perfect radiator in a sphere pattern at zero dB. So whatever goes in comes out. Um, and again, it's a theoretical value. You're never going to see that anywhere on Earth. Okay. Um, decibels, everybody knows what those are, measure of RF intensity um, in a logarithmic scale. Parasitic array, um, that's where you have a driven element or dr driven elements and you have reflectors and, and directors involved with that. Antenna gain, um, everybody likes to get gain on their antennas. It's defined as efficiency plus directivity in measured in decibels. So um, it's a comparative measurement between the antenna radiation pattern against that you know, isotropic antenna or you can have a difference in gain between two different types of antennas um, to see what the difference in dB. That's basically all it is, is the difference between the two. Um, angle of radiation, that's takeoff angle, okay? 
important for us DXers. We like low angle radiation because that gets us long skips, okay? Um, and basically that's where the signal takes off and what angle it's traveling at. And then you have front to back re uh, rejection. That's basically how much signal you knock down off the back of your receive, okay? Um, so that if you're trying to work a contest and you're working a specific part of the world, if you have a omnidirectional antenna, you're getting noise from everywhere. If you point your antenna and you've got good front back reflection or re rejection, you're getting information from where you have your antenna pointed and all that stuff in the background is knocked down, okay? And then the opposite as reactivity, right? That's where you're sending that signal, right? You're compressing that signal, sending it forward, and you want that to go in the direction you want it to go in, okay? So those are the easy terms that we'll have here. Okay, so vertical antennas. Um, most HF vertical antennas you'll find will be quarter wave. On some of the higher bands, like 10 meters, you might see some 5 8 waves, okay? Um, the imperial formula, which is in feet, is 234 divided by the frequency, and that gives you a rough number, and then you have to kind of figure out what your velocity factor of wire is. Um, so insulated wire, um, the signal travels a little bit slower than it will in a um, uh, bare copper wire, okay? So each wire has its own different velocity factor. If you're using an insulated wire, say 12 to 16 gauge, you're somewhere between 0.92 and 0.96% of the speed of light, okay? So um, you would multiply that and that would give you your length of your radiator. So um, same thing for metric, it's 71.1 divided by, you'll hear somebody say 71.3, 71.1, it's all about the same. 71.1 uh, has that fudge factor for velocity factor in a little bit. Um, radials can be any length that you want them to be. But ideally, when you build that radiator field, you want at least two times the total wavelength of the antenna you're building. So if you're building something for 40 meters, you want 80 meters of wire down in that radial field, okay? Um, you can put more radials down, but you return into the laws of diminishing returns, right? So the labor versus the gain, probably not there. And it's about two wavelengths. Um, you still see a little bit of gain after that, but, you know, like AM radio stations, FM radio stations, when they have their broadcast tower, they've got 120 radials down. They got one every three degrees. But they're trying to eke out every tenth, hundredth of a decibel of gain because of the power bill that is associated with that running, okay? And then quick tools um, for you. There's a couple websites where they have uh, calculators. So you can put in your megahertz and it'll tell you what your length is, okay? And that's, yes, sir? Yeah, so if you got a, no, no, that's total, that's total length of all the radials. So if I have four radials, each 20, and yes. I needed 80 meters of radial, that would do it. Yeah, that would do it. Now you can, you know, you can cut down your radial field shorter. So let's just say you had, you needed four 10 meter radials, okay, for a 20 meter. You can make that eight, five meters if that's what you want to do, okay? Um, there's a little give and take there, but it's not enough to make a difference, okay? So... This is an example of a 40 meter quarter wave uh, vertical. Okay, so um, let's see if I get over here. Okay, so this is a view of it, how it looks in 3D. This is a, a radiation pattern layout of basically down the axis of that. Okay, so this is a field view. This is a top view. If you could see that RF bubble, it looked like this. Okay. And then that's what it actually looks like in a 3D model. Okay, so it looks like a donut. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to reduce this for a second here. And I'm going to bring up MNNA. Okay, so this is actually the tool that I was talking about using the design. So come over here, and I'm going to open up a file. This will be open. Let's see. Forty meter vertical. Okay, so there you go. That's the antenna. Okay, 
So in order to get this built, you would come over here to this here, which is wire edit, okay? And it gives you this blank field. And then you can come over here and it'll give you your grid patterns, X and Y, Y and Z, X and Z, and you can draw in this, in this screen, okay? So basically you take it, you come over here and you just draw a line, okay? And that'll tell you how long the line is, it'll give you your coordinates, all of that. That, that was just if I was drawing a wire in the air for an antenna, okay? So here's, here's a 10 meter, basically about a 10 meter wire here. Um, let me go back to the view. Let's see. So we got a 10.15 meter segment of wire and basically it's straight vertical, okay, along the, on the, along the Z axis. So okay that. So now I've got that built. So now I want to look at what this wire is capable of, okay? So I'm going to tell it I'm looking for 40 meters, so let's just say 7.150, okay, is the frequency I'm looking for. I hit the calculate, and it gives me the frequency, it gives me the resistance, it gives me the reactance, it gives me the SWR for that antenna. It shows me the gain, okay, and it shows me the elevation of what that gain is at. And I need to do this real quick. <laughs> I had this set up to play around with seawater. So this is the ground field, okay? Um, usually your dielectric around here in most places in the southeast is 13.0. This is the conductivity of the soil. That's meters, um, milli Siemens per meter. Siemens is, is basically the um, unit they use for conductivity, okay? So around here it's about five on, you know, mostly dry, sandy, clay soil, it's about five. Um, when you get out near the ocean, that really goes up because you get the salt water and it could be about five Siemens per meter versus five milli Siemens, so about a thousand times more conductive. So let's run this again with the right um, value here and 7150, okay, that's more like it. I got a dB gain of seven, a 0.75 at 26.7 degrees, okay? So let's go look at the far field plots. This is giving me my 0 0.7, it's giving me my largest gain, okay? And this shows you the RF bubble, okay? Now, the reason I'm getting a gain out of a vertical antenna, which I shouldn't be getting gain out of, is because of what I've done, okay? That's not a sphere. I've squeezed that RF down into a donut, okay? So I've taken that perfect radiation pattern of a sphere and squeezed it down. So all that RF I'm radiating has to go somewhere, right? It just doesn't disappear. You can't create it out of nothing and you can't destroy it. So it's gotta go somewhere. So as I squeeze that, the sides get bigger so more of that RF goes out the sides at certain angles, okay? That's why we end up with a donut pattern, okay? Omnidirectional, 360 degrees. Um, and you can look at the elevation, say you're doing DX, we talked about five to 10 degrees, let's look at 10 degrees. That radiation pattern changed, right? Because that bubble is smaller on the bottom where I have that lower degree of takeoff. So now I'm looking at negative 1.9 dB, okay? So I'm losing a little bit. When I squeeze it down, it's going up into the higher elevations, right? So I'm gonna, whatever I'm putting in, I'm gonna be minus 1.9 dB down from whatever my loss is in my cable and what I'm putting out of my transmitter, okay? So that gives you a good idea of how the software works. I mean, it's, it, you really have to sit down and play with it to look at it and say, hey, this is what it's doing, okay? So I'm gonna close this for a second. We'll come back to it here. Let me get my mouse back over here. And let's go. Okay. So how do we achieve gain? We've talked about some of this. Uh, it's defined as efficient, uh, efficiency plus directivity in measured in dBs, a comparative measure. And you get it by adding elements or changing the position of the elements. Okay. So if we add elements to an antenna, say a vertical, we make it a parasitic array. Um, you can do a phased array, all kinds of different things with it, or you can change the position of those elements 
to push the RF in a direction you want, right? So you get that gain where you want it to go. Uh, okay, so back over here. Well, I went one too far. Okay, so now we're looking at a two element vertical, okay? So now I've got one, I've had one element here, now I've added a second element, okay? This element is the driven element. It's got that little red dot at the bottom, okay? This element, because it's a little bit longer, is now a reflector, okay? So your reflector is going to be longer than your driven element. A director, if you would have a three element, would be a little bit shorter, okay? So you're taking that RF and you're pushing it through off those and pushing it forward. So now our pattern has changed a little bit. That donut's kind of squeezed on this end and everything's bubbling out this side, right? And look at the pattern here. Now you've really squeezed that donut down from the top and you can see how it looks. And here is the 3D modeling of that, okay? So I've taken all that RF that I had in that donut, I've taken that back side of the donut and I've kind of crushed it down and everything went out the front, okay? So I'm squirting that RF out. Um, so what kind of gain can we see with something like this? Um, so the single element, max gain was 1.29 dB at 26 degrees. Our degree at 10 was 1 1.4, negative 1 1.4 dB. We had zero fat to, uh, front to back rejection because it's omnidirectional. Now we're looking at it and we've got a max gain of 5.26 dB at 23.7 degrees. So where that thing was really thick and it was pushing out, 5.26 uh, dB a gain, okay? And we had a front to back ratio of 5.98. So we're knocking basically that signal down by, a, by, a cool, by three quarters of what you're getting on the back side. At 10 degrees, which is, you know, you look at the comparative, right? I can't really compare those two antennas at the max gain because it's the, the takeoff angle is different. But if I look at 10 degrees, right, I get 2.9 dBi a gain with a front to back of 7.9, okay? The effective degree, get, by adding that second element, I got 2.9 minus the 1.4, so I'm plus 4.3 dB better with that antenna by adding that one element, okay? And that's equivalent of 2.81 times the radiated power. So if I, just for giggles, we're putting out the full 100 watts, no loss in the coax. So in that direction where that 2.81 gain is at, I've taken that 100, I've made it 281 watts in that direction, okay? So now I'm losing it everywhere else, but I'm pushing it where I want it, right? So, talk about a three element, okay? Now we've got, over here, we've got our driven element in the center, we've got a reflector on the back, and we've got our director up front, okay? Kind of looks like a Yagi, you know, almost. Um, but basically, you have the three elements. Richard, did you have a question? No, no, you've got one driven here. This is parasitic. Oh, driven is the same thing as the radiator. Yeah, exactly. It's driven element is the radiator. Right. Now we have a reflector here, which is a little bit longer, and a director, which is a little bit shorter. Okay? So now I'm squeezing that RF even harder. Okay? So now I'm really putting the screws to it. I'm telling it, go from the front, go from the back to the front, and I'm shooting it out the front, and I'm giving focus it even more. Okay? My pattern down here has become tighter in its bandwidth, okay? But I'm getting more gain, okay? You can see it in the, in the 3D. So let's take a look at how much more gain now. We got on the two element, we were plus 2.9 at 10 degrees. Now we're 4.7, okay? So we've almost doubled it again, okay? Or not quite doubled it by adding that third element, by putting that director out front, okay? So now an effective gain 10 degrees over that single element, I'm 6.1 dB. So now I've taken that 100 watts with no loss in it. By adding those two other elements, I've gone from 100 to 200, that's my first 3 dB, then 200 to 400. So now that 100 watt radio, where that thing's pointed, sounds like a 400 watt radio, okay? So, um, 
we get to that three element. The downside for this three element, right, right now, if we go back and look at this slide, it's in one direction. I can't switch that. I'd have to take the poles, turn the poles around, okay, in order to switch it to the other direction. If I wanted to go at a 90 degrees, I'd take those poles, those outside poles, and move them 90 degrees, okay? A little different problem, okay? How far will the poles separate? Um, it's usually a quarter wavelength there. Now, we'll tell you this. If you model it on a quarter wavelength, it should model okay in general practice. That front one, that reflector is a little bit closer. So it's like 0.91 times the quarter wavelength. So if that quarter wavelength was 10 meters that I wanted for 40 meters, it would actually be about 9.1 meters. There's something kinky again in that software that it just doesn't model it exactly right. And it took me a while to figure that out. So it, there's some trial and error learning. But you put the back one a quarter away from that one, and then you put the front one about 91% of that full quarter wavelength, and that thing sings like a champ. Okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, so again, this is a parasitic array. So he asked, how do you interconnect the antennas? So with this one, you only have one driven element. So you're running that coax at one. The other elements, the radiating element or director reflector element that you would basically use, and the ground plane are shorted together. Okay? So what you do is you take, basically, just like I did out here at Phil Bay, my radiating plate, or my radial plate, I had the element attached here from going up the pole, the reflector, and I put a piece of coax in there with a PL235 screwed it on, and I shorted out the braid and the center conductor. So basically I made an effective short circuit between the radials and that vertical element, okay? So it basically turns it into a reflector at that point in time. Now, with a parasitic array, you've got one direction, one direction only. You can't change it, okay? What we're gonna talk about now is a parasitic you can change by changing your shorting point, making your reflector at a different point in the antenna. And this is what I built for field day. And again, a lot of this information came from Callum McCormick, M0MCX over. He's got a YouTube channel. Great guy, smart, funny guy. Understands antennas like crazy, okay? And he, he models this software. He's got tutorials on the software. There was a guy he's friends with, and he's over in Ireland, I believe. His name's Rolly. I don't remember his call sign. But he built something called a flamethrower antenna. And basically, it was a parasitic array, two elements. But he put a reflector and a director, and a reflector and a director. So he had this four-element array. Again, focused one direction only. But the gain on it was massive. So I was like, man, I'm going to build that for field day. So I sent a couple emails back and forth, and we were talking via email. And he said, hang on, I got something I think you might like better. So he put this antenna out on his channel. Um, let's see. It's a three-element triangular parasitic array. Okay. Now, there's two ways you can work with this antenna. You can have one driven element and two reflectors, or you can have two driven elements and one reflector, okay? So in order to do that, I built it with two driven elements and one, re one reflector, okay? The two driven elements are fed in phase, which means I just use the same length of coax from the T piece, from the coax coming from the radio. Same length, it's gotta be the same length. If you change the length of those two, you're gonna phase the antenna, it's gonna act really weird, okay? And we'll talk about phasing here in a minute, but. I took a T piece, took two pieces of 50, or 50 ohm LMR 400, ran them out to the antenna, and I shorted the one I didn't want active. Okay, that let me steer the antenna in three different directions. Okay, so here we go. This is what it looks like on the sides here. This equilateral triangle, and it's important. It has to be equilateral. Okay, and equilateral means 180 degrees in the triangle, 60 at each angle. Okay, 
the lengths of all those sides are the same. And they're one quarter wavelength apart. So this distance to here is one quarter, this distance to here is one quarter, this distance to here is one quarter, okay? Quarter, quarter uh, wave verticals and a radial field under each one of those, okay? Now, when we were in the field in practice, we didn't connect the, radi the radials, okay? Where the radials crossed, if we had connected them, we'd have got a little more gain. But trying to figure all that out in the two or three days I built this antenna, I wasn't doing it. So we just laid the radials on top of each other, gave up the, the half a dB of gain or whatever we were going to get out of it extra by connecting the radials. I wasn't worried about it. Radiation pattern very similar to that three element parasitic array. It's a little bit tighter, a little, little more RF going out of it, okay? But the key to it is it is steerable, okay? So the three element parasitic, we had 6.7 dB again, 4.7 at 10 degrees. This one, we're at 3.3 at 10 degrees. We gave up a little bit, okay? One dB. Now, one dB, Andy and everybody in here knows, is less than a quarter of an S unit, okay? And when you're talking about a significant gain on a 100 watt radio, a quarter of an S unit to somebody far away from you ain't gonna make a hill of beans a difference, okay? I gave that up to be able to steer this array, okay? So we can point this thing where we want it. So over a single element, if we just put a single element out there, we still were multiplying our radiated power by three, minus the losses in the coax, okay? So huge gain over a single element, fairly wide beam width. So I look at it saying, okay, if I can double my power over what it would be with a regular single element, we had 154 degrees, okay? So when you're looking at the sky and you say, I'm looking at the horizon, that's 180 degrees, so we're squeezing that just a little bit, taking down 154 degrees. I could manually switch this, and if you really got fancy, could put a, f a box in the middle and switch them on and off to ground, okay? It was easy enough to go out there and change the coax around. All I'm doing is two changes. Um, huge advantage of easily steering this thing, and this was kind of what the radiation pattern, I have a better picture of this for you to look at. So, you've all heard the term saltwater amplifier. I'm sure you guys have. Taking an antenna, especially a vertical near the beach. Typically, they tell you if you're gonna be near the beach, you can expect somewhere between six and 10 dB a gain, okay? Depending on the type of antenna. So, I modeled this thing for 5,000 millisiemens or five siemens per meter in the ground setup with 16 radials, like you would do a normal one. It flattened out that curve on the bottom, okay? So now my angle of radiation came down, my RF bubble came down, so now I'm launching those signals with a lot of gain at low angles. And what does that translate to? DX, okay? You get one of these near the salt water, you will be, without an amplifier, you will be loud and you will be heard. You'll bust pileups all over the place. Um, so uh, I'd encourage you, if you're gonna be at the beach, even if you just take a standard vertical down to the beach and play with it in salt water, you're still gonna see about six dB a gain, okay? Um, so how did I build this thing? Okay. So each element is the same, three elements. You've got a 12 meter spider beam pole, which is this bad boy here, heavy duty. Well, I mean, you can get away with a lighter duty pole. I want, I bought heavy duty poles just to be able to do other things with them, okay? But this telescope's out to 12 meters, okay, which is about 42 feet. And then we have a radial plate, which is homebrew. Don't laugh at my homebrew. It's basically an electrical um, plate cover for a four by four inch box. Drilled some holes in it, put some screws and bolts through it. Um, bought a bracket and put an SO230, uh, SO238 on there, okay? Simple and easy, okay? You can build one of these, you know, build a plate like that in probably an hour. Between drilling the plate out, putting the thing on there, making the radials, an hour. Doesn't take long. How many radials? That one has eight on it right now. Eight, 10 meters. 
So basically, it's 80 meters of radial, 2x a 40 four element or uh, 40 vertical. Okay. Um, so here are the yellows that that radiating element. Okay. I double guide the thing down to the ground, which I'm glad I did because we had some hellacious winds out there. If you were out there, you knew that. Um, and then the radials went out from the plate in all different directions. Used a little bit of eighth inch uh, bungee cord, um, shock cord, whatever you want to call it, to tie off the top of the antenna down to the radial, or the radiating element to keep it straight, okay, and taut. Because you don't want that, that element all wiggly waggly around the pole because it's going to change your SWR and you'll have all kinds of issues. Um, and there's the build on the, on the homebrew plate. So, what are the dimensions of that triangle? Quarter wave on each length. It was uh, 10 meters on each side, 32, not 32 feet, 9 and 5 eighths inches. Okay? So what we did when we set this thing up, Matt, you were out there. Ted, I think you were out there too. And Philip was out there. We set a set point for the, for the bottom of the antenna, the bottom leg of the antenna, dead center. And we went out 5 meters on either side and put a stake for each one of those. And I did the math, which is basically to find out the height of the triangle. If you know the length of one of the side for the hypotenuse in the right triangle, it's the length of that side times the square root of three, which is 1.732, and you divide that by two, okay? And basically, if you take those figures, punch in a calculator, you get 8.6 meters, okay? So then we measured straight up 8.6 meters and placed that third element, okay? So, that's what you're looking at. Very easy to set up. Once you do it the first time and you have all your guy lines cut and your radials cut and you know how it goes together, you can put that antenna up by yourself and I would guess under an hour. Okay? Doesn't take long. So here's the radiating patterns. Okay? So remember I said I had two driven elements and one I shorted out, so I had one reflector. So Basically, I had element one facing west, element two facing east, element three was north, okay? So when I put element one and two in phase, which means I fed them both directly, same length of coax, and I shorted out this third element, it pushed all the RF south, okay? So I had this big bubble RF going south, 154 degrees, of which was 3 dB better than a single radiator. Okay. When I put element one and three, so now I'm here and here, I pushed all that RF to the northwest. Okay, at about 60 degrees off of uh, off of west, so it was northwest north. Okay, or north more northwest. And then when I put two and three in, so these two, I was pushing everything off to the northeast. Okay. So we started out the morning pushing, or the contest pushing everything northeast and we were picking up everything along the Atlantic seaboard everything from Virginia all the way up to the French Maritimes and we were just blowing it up going up the coast and then that storm hit we took everything down and blah 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 we got back in there later on in the evening I turned that thing northwest and boy howdy from up through Tennessee Kentucky Ohio Michigan Illinois Iowa all the way up through the center of Canada, all the way out to the west coast. We were just booming and picking up stations. And then a little bit later, I turned it south just to see what it would do. We got into the Caribbean, and we got into Florida. We had Brazil and a few others. So, um, But very, very good performance out of the antenna. Okay. Um, so let's talk about phasing for a second. There is a way to make this automatic. Okay, without having to do anything and get a little more gain. Okay, what you can do is build a switch box here in the center. You feed these two or the two elements you want driven in phase, so you mean you're the same length of coax, and you put and all three of them are fed and fed with the fed with the same length. Inside that switch box is a coil of 75 ohm coax which is called a phasing line. And basically it's a delay, right? It takes a signal longer to travel through that 75 ohm coax. So you're making this electrical, electric, if you were using this one, you put that 75 ohm in, in line with this, 
you're making that electrically longer, you're delaying that, okay? So you're making it a bigger reflector, okay? So you have to figure out what the phasing is. They told us what the phasing was for this antenna, okay? Phasing on this antenna is of 60 degrees, okay? So what you have to do is you got a sine wave, right? Zero, 90, 180, 270, 360 is your sine wave. That's a full wave, right? So I want 60% of that. Or six, uh, I want 60 degrees of that. So you have to figure out what the length is of that wavelength at 60 degrees. You cut that coax, multiply by the velocity factor, and that gives you how long that phasing line is. And you cool it up in there, okay? So, and then you feed the TP or the, the box here back to your 50 ohm coax back to your radio, okay? Very simple to design. The box is not complicated to build. The switching part is a little more complicated, the actual control module. So I laid out the switching matrix for this. So here's your 50 ohm coax coming in, right? You take the braid and you run it to one side of a double pull, double throw relay. You take your, and there's supposed to be a line going to here, I missed it. Um, your center core and it goes to the red line and that goes to the other side of that double pole, double throw relay, okay? So now I got my two terminals here and I've got a switch that's gonna switch between bottom and top, okay? The bottom of this, which would be the normally closed position, is sending each of those to an element, one, two, and three, okay? So each of those are seeing equal lengths of this coax, okay? Now, if I take the switch and I turn it on and I activate that relay, it goes from what was the normally closed position to the normally open position and closes that relay, okay? So now, instead of that uh, coax connection going through this relay and going out to I1 or to the element one, it actually flows up to a second relay, which is double poles, but only a single throw, okay? So it's either on or it's off, okay? So if you wire these two together, when you turn the power on to this one down here, it turns power on this one, it closes that relay. Now that feeds into this 60 ohm phasing line, out the 60 ohm phasing line to element one. So now element one is 60 degrees out of phase with the other two, and now I'm pushing that RF between two and three out, okay? Same thing, if I turn, if I turn on two but leave one and three off, I'm doing the same thing. That phase line goes to two, it goes to three. It's that easy. So you could build a little box that you have three switches in and you just turn them on and off and you have a line going out there and it turns all the relays on. Or you can get fancy and make an Arduino controller, another set of relays and you tell it what you want it to do. The interesting thing is if you play around a little bit with the distance and the element lengths, okay, I tried to do it and I couldn't get it to quite work right the way I wanted to do it. And I think I'm gonna have to add in some coils in somewhere in the system to um, electrically lengthen at certain points. Because what you end up with, if you try to do this, and what I'm saying is you try to do this in a six, six position steerable. So you take the three with one radiator and then you take the other three with two radiators. So you're putting in two phasing lines. Um, the box becomes a little bit more tough to build, but it's not, it's not unsurmountable. I got the design for it done. But you end up with two diverging SWR curves, right? So one way the SWR curve on the low ends here and it starts to take off rapidly on the high end of the band. The other one, it starts high on the high end of the low end of the band and goes down. So trying to find the sweet spot in the middle, you never really get the SWR down about below two or just below two. So you have some issues there with SWR. Um, Again, if I think if I add some cools into it, I can electrically lengthen one of those and move that curve so they're kind of sitting on top of each other. Um, again, that's another math problem I'm working on. But anyway, so that's a basic switching network for it, okay? Now, when I take it, let's see, and this is supposed to be phased down here, but you get 5.79, 3.5 dB again. So it's a little better than the one that you'd had with the, with the shorted element, okay? Um, 
And when you put this thing there, salt water, 9.6, 9.46 dB a game, okay? Um, so that being said, I wanted to show you a little more about um, the MNNA software. I've got some models built so you can kind of see what it looks like. Um, any questions about the antennas? Yes, sir. How do you, when you design your antenna, mm -hmm. the software, the scale, all that, but um, the first that you were talking about, the white element being uh, the point nine one the length of the array, mm -hmm. and have you done any uh, far field measurements? No, I don't have a, a range meter to do that, and the wavelengths we use, I have one, but it's for cellular array wavelength. Um, so I don't have a spectrum analyzer to go out and do it. I can tell you what the modeling does, and I can tell you in practical experience. Um, when I do test the antennas, um, we, we tested this antenna Friday night, the three, the three element, and um, we were just booming everywhere we pointed the thing. Uh, the guys were talking to guys out in California, and we were 30 and 40 over um, with a 100-watt radio. So uh, we were down, I was hitting into Brazil Friday night, and we were 40 over into Brazil. We pointed up the northeast seaboard. There was a guy in Nova Scotia. He said, I had to take off his headphones. We were so loud. So um, the antenna works. Um, again, I wish we had a little can of, of spray you know, something like RF reveal, and you got there and spray the antenna and it shows you where the RF's going, but nobody's come up with that yet. Maybe, Vic, that's your next idea, brother. Yeah, um, but anyway, so let's talk about MNNA, if you, if you guys will indulge me for a second here. Um, so just for giggles, let's open up, uh, let's see, where is it at? 40 meter parasitic. There it is over salt water. Okay, so this is the this is the antenna. Okay, again we've got three driven elements now, right? Okay, because I've got all three connected through that switch box. If you look at the geometry, and if you if you don't like drawing on the screen, if you can do the math in your head, you can do the geometry here and just enter in the coordinates: x1 coordinate, beginning of the line, y coordinate, z coordinate, and then you can draw in 3D. Okay. Um, and I got to the point, if it's a simple antenna, I'd just rather do it here than do it um, sitting there drawing and trying to get my lines directly right. I know I can get my, my calculation directly in there and have it in there. So again, here's that 60. Now, these are where your sources are at. So wire one base, wire two base, wire three base. Those are those three red dots, OK? Um, and then here's my phasing degree. I'm going to feed these two in, in phase, one and three. And I'm gonna put that delay line on on two, okay? So now I got the delay line on two. So I'm gonna calculate. I'm gonna make sure my ground setup's right, okay? I'm gonna take my radials. Let's just make it 16 radials. Enter. Ground setup, and we're gonna make this 5,000 milli siemens or five siemen, siemens per meter, which is conductivity at, at the seashore. We're going to OK that. Now we're going to go up here and pick my frequency, 7.150. And we're going to hit Start. And we have an SWR of 1.5 for that antenna at 7.150. We get a gain of 9.6. The elevation is 9 degrees. Our front to back is minus 11.74. That thing's going to be nice, right? Especially since it's steerable. If you're on an island, and you got nothing but salt water around you, holy smoke, you put that thing up on the beach and you're gonna be just having a blast. Um, now you can also change the frequency. You don't have to use the, the canned frequencies. So let's say we wanna take it up into the general portion of the band, let's say, I don't know, 230, huh? 192. Huh? 192. 192. 192, let's see what she looks like at 192. Come on, start. Uh, my SWR climbed a little bit, um, and that may be just something funky in the way it looks, but there's my far-filled plot. There's my 3D look at that bubble, right? So I've taken all that RF that was radiating off all these, now I'm pushing it that way, okay? 
Um, like I said, this is a pretty powerful tool. It takes a little bit of getting used to. You know, again, with seawater, we can see that this thing is right along the ground. So there's no reason to look at the elevation because all the, all the high gains at the bottom of it, right? But let's just say we wanted to do a, um, let's say we wanted to do a dipole, inverted V dipole, okay? Um, let's go here and we'll go to water element. And let's say we want to do it for 20 meters. So um, half wave dipole, it's five meters a side, right? For a half wave dipole, 10 meters a 20. So um, let's take a line here here. I'm on the X and Y. I'm going to take a line here and I'm going to go, oh no, I want X and Z. X and Z, I'm on that one. Okay. So I'm going to take a line here and I'm going to go just a little bit. So I have my center point and I'll adjust it. And I'm going to come down here, maybe like that. Is that 10 meters? It's a little bit long. We'll adjust it. And I'm going to come here. And now I've kind of built the dipole, okay? Inverted V. So now I'm going to go, okay, I'm going to come back to my geometry. Now, I've got this thing at 15 meters in height, so this thing ought to really freaking sing. Um, uh, let's see what I want to do here. Y. One, zero. Okay. Change this to five. We'll change this one to five. Uh, y2, nine meters. Y2, nine meters. Okay. Let's see what this looks like now. No, that's not right. Bear with me a second here. Right, I've screwed this up. I'll delete that. I'll delete that. Let's try again here. say 2.5 meters on that length. Okay. Let me go here and use this. So, you, now I have my dipole. So, I don't know what that is up there. Let me get back here and see what that stupid thing is. Delete that. Okay. Now let's go back. Okay, so now I've got my dipole built. I'm going to come up this little wire here, and I'm going to put my source in the center of that wire. So that's a center fed dipole now, okay? Now, I don't know exactly where I'm at with the whole thing, but I ought to be pretty close. Um, let's go to calculate. We said this was 20 meters, so let's just shoot at 14,150 and see where we're at. Oh, we don't need radials. Let me get the radials turned on. Um, wait a minute. Let me see my was height. I'm going to add 10 meters of height to this. So calculate. I'm going to add 10 meters of height. I got copper wire and I want to start. Oh, hey, look at that. Can't ask for any better than that with just looking at it. SWR of 1.9, 1.09. Um, I think the ground setup, I think we still had it over seawater. Uh, we'll just leave it there. You get all kinds of gain over seawater anyways. Um, so now let's look at our far field plots. So there's where my bubbles are, FR. I have to look down the center. I got one big bubble going straight up in the air. That's going to be great for NVES, right? Yes, Mike.
Yeah, you want to take you want to take that degree and squeeze it down and see what happens with the pattern? Yeah, sure. I've heard you go straight into the air. I don't know. Well, let's take a look. All right. So Oh, and that blue right there? Yeah. That's that's called they, they show the current on the on the wire, okay? So the further away from the wire the higher the current, okay? And if it's in blue, it's horizontal. If it's in red, it's vertical. Just so you know. Um, so we want to go up here, and I want to adjust this feed point. I'm going to bring this feed point down tighter, right? Yeah. That should be pretty close. That should be pretty close. I don't know what the SWR is going to look like because I don't. I don't know if these lengths are exactly right. But it, it'll show you what the pattern is. It'll just resonate differently. Okay. So let's just shoot it again. You got almost the same pattern, but you got a lot of RF going straight up. Yeah. And, and again, you can now if we want to look and see where that's resonant at, we can come here and we go to um, put the SWR plot on and hit resonance. Fifteen point. Six two, so when you squeeze that down, that our our SWR is going to go up anyways. And that's true too. You might be able to do that. We can try that. What do you want to do? You want to go twenty meters? So twenty sixty meters? No, twenty be thirty meters, right? Thirty meters. Let's try 30. Oh, and the other thing I will tell you about this program, if you're changing a value anywhere that's a numeric value, always hit the enter button. If you try to click mouse click and click to the next one, it doesn't accept the value. You came down a little bit, Andy. <laughs> uh, let's see what the far field plot. Oh, now you really, you, you got it putting all kinds of lobes out there now. Let's see what it looks like in 3D. Holy smoke, look at that. Yeah, if I change the angle, it's going to change that radiation pattern a whole lot. Um, but yeah, that's that's crazy. That actually wouldn't be bad for MCOM, right? Because you got all those lobes. <coughs> send it at end edge, you send it at, at low radiation angles. Now the key is, you know, what's my gain here? Um, seven one, but we're over seawater, so that really doesn't matter. Let's go back and do this over regular ground and see what this looks like at five. Start. Plots. Yeah, the gain's still high. Yeah, still got a little bit of gain there. So, um, let's see. At about ten degrees, you get seven point one, six point four. At about twenty-one degrees. About 60 degrees, you got 5.8, and straight up and down, you got um, 90 degrees, you got 1.2 dB. So. Mm -hmm. Now, don't forget, you got these big nulls too, though, right? Yeah. So this thing's going to be kind of like a spider putting out its legs all over the place, right? You're going to have some NVES coming off of it. You're going to have some real short skip. You're going to have some real crazy long skip. So kind of crazy. And you got this nice peanut shape along the x-axis, right? So your highest point gain is going to be, if you put this thing east-west along that x-axis, it's going to push out east and west, right? It's not broadside, okay? Broadside, you get these big lobes in here, so. Interesting anyways. But that's the MNA software. I mean, you can do all kinds of crazy stuff. Um, that flamethrower antenna, um, that's what it looks like. So this is... 60% of a wavelength, 0.6 wavelength. It's a quarter to back. Um, I don't think I drew this one exactly right. I think the SWR is off just a little bit on this. No, that's good. 1.39. And there's your far field plot. Okay. And that's not exactly right. It's, there's something pinky here going on because that, that plot should look a lot like that three element but tighter. It's a different cardioid type pattern. But anyway, so that's the software. Anybody have any questions? I'd encourage you to get this and play around with it. I mean, it's fun, and it might 
trigger you to do something and build an antenna. I'm, I'm actually, I didn't think antenna building would be one of the things I'd do in the hobby. All of a sudden, I'm like, hey, I like building antennas. So, um, yeah, have fun with it. That's what the hobby's about. It's uh, downloadable. Um, yeah. That's all right. No, I'll go back up here and pull it up. Yeah. Um, let me just move this over here. So this this software, if you have an existing antenna and you want to improve its yeah, here you go. Sure. You can put the, the data, yeah. dimensions of your antenna, mm -hmm. and then adjust. Like, yeah, you get your baseline put in, and then you adjust it how you want it. In fact, I was going to ask Ted to go out and measure his antenna, and I knew he didn't have trouble to do it. But I, his, his antenna, is a, it's a dipole, right? Yes. So off-center fed dipole. So he's got the feed point in his house. It comes out to the corners of the house and then goes down to poles. It goes up now, doesn't it? Yeah, it goes straight out. It goes straight out. So he's got kind of a U yeah. shaped. And that'd be interesting to see how that modeled, but I need to get the distances so I can model it correctly. And then you could say, okay, well if I take if I take the poles that I've got instead of going this way and back out, maybe I take those poles and I put them further back out in the yard and I've got enough room to take it off and go this way now and down so that inverted V I still have an inverted V, but it's kind of splayed out. It's kind of flattened. And see what the radiation pattern looks like. Maybe it's better than what you got now. Yeah. You know, go on the other side of the house. Yeah. Follow that same pattern. You have a moxin. Yeah. So I did model a moxin, but it's on the other PC. I did it. Um, there was an article about a moxin antenna, and I wanted to see what the radiation pattern. That's an interesting antenna. I may build one of those for 40 meters and put it up on a pole. We'll yeah. I've heard, I haven't seen it, but I, I know what you're talking about. I did a presentation on that about two years ago. It's free, and it's pretty powerful stuff, too. Cool. You can do, it does a lot of modeling, and it will even do what ifs. You tell what parameters you want to Yeah, and I think Easy Neck will do that, too. Right. Um, this one is a little more basic, but um, if you want a t good, really good tutorial, not what I just did, um, kind of a fast blow your head off with it. Go to YouTube and look up uh, DX Commander and go through his videos or do uh, MNNA um, tutorial. And he has two or three really good segments out there, about 10 or 12 minutes each, and he goes through all kinds of different designs. Um, but again, I learned a lot from the guy. I have to thank him for what he taught me so I can do this for you guys and build that antenna and everything else. So, um, again, it's about sharing in this hobby. So, if there's no more questions, I'm going to close it down. Thank you, guys.